Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, COO here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I'm super excited to have Hayden McWhorter, CIO at Premise Health, as my guest. I've had the pleasure of interviewing a few very senior IT leaders on this podcast, and Hayden ranks right up there among that top group. With over 30 years of experience in IT and 15 years at the C-level, Hayden has pretty much seen it all. Besides being an incredibly nice guy, Hayden does a great job in our conversation sharing his thoughts on how the relationship between the IT and the business sides of the house has evolved over his career and what he's done to try to manage that relationship well. We also get into mentorship, dealing with ever-changing technology, and a little bit of how to manage private equity investors to boot. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Hayden McWhorter. Hayden, welcome to Cut the Shit. and Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So um, really excited to have you on today. Uh, but before we kind of get into the meat of the discussion, um, how about we start with you giving us an example of, you know, the most interesting use of technology, kind of like a hack or something that was surprising to you that you've seen recently from clients or colleagues um, you know, or even from your own personal experience. Uh, so that's funny. Uh, I, I'm trying to think about that. Um, I would say the most interesting thing probably has to do with my, at my own home and what my daughter has been able to do. So, um, you know, uh, when I grew up, I, I'm a, I'm 55 years old. So I, I grew up in the eighties, you know, in high school, uh, I was kind of a, a little bit of a geek. I helped put the computer lab together and, you know, we didn't have access to computers at home. I mean, I had an Apple, ended up getting an Apple, but didn't have access to computers at home. I worked at a computer store that allowed me to bring stuff home, but now I think it's amazing how quickly, uh, especially teens, are picking up. And, and I'm sure I'm, my, all my kids are, I've got a 20-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 16-year-old. But their ability, how fast they pick up technology and then use technology. Um, I was talking to my youngest about uh, chat GPT and some other things. And things that she's already thought about, ways it could be used bad and ways it could be used good. I just think that's pretty cool. Um and so, you know, that's probably a lame answer, but it's just really, I think, how integrated technology really is becoming with everyday, everybody's life. And, and um, especially, you know, I wonder, uh, I, I ask my kids, I can't get them to respond to email. And they're like, you know, we don't use email. We use text or Snapchat or whatever else. And I kind of joke, I said, hey, when you go to the real world, you're going to have to respond to email. So you need to respond to dad's emails. Um, but I, I always also ask them, I was like, I wonder how you will break down the communication barrier that we have. Because my dad was, you know, if he was in an office, it was a phone, probably the same for your dad. Now you and I are hung up on email and those type of things. And I wonder where our kids, how they'll use technology to best benefit communication and interaction in the workplace. So lame answer. No, not, not a lame answer. Um, I mean, you'd be surprised. I've asked that question of a lot of people and uh, the, the, the number of responses I've gotten that has to do with someone's children or someone young, it's, it's not, it's, it's non-trivial for sure. For the, for the reason you said, because they're so good at integrating technology. Right. And I'm like you, I've got a 24 and a 22 year old and you know, they don't remember growing up without technology. Right. That's it's, you know, in the, in, in the way we're talking about, I mean, we had technology in the eighties too, but it wasn't like today. Right. So it's a, it's a different deal for sure. Well, um, and I think, and I, and I would just say one more thing, the thing I think that's cool is because we're doing some stuff here at the office that, is requiring us all to, to kind of go out and try to find some training on our own is the amount of free information out there today that's well put together around just about anything you'd want to work on. If you want to know Python, if you want to, you know, like you don't really have to like, again, back in my day, in the beginning, you had to go to, you know, uh, what they were, I can't remember what the, it was like a known company you went and you sat for four days in a room and now mm-hmm. you can, you know, self pace all that stuff. That's, that's pretty cool to me too. I mean, YouTube is probably the greatest educational resource that's ever been created. I mean, no joke, right? Outside. I mean, I mean, there's the library and then there's YouTube, right? I mean, I, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to be flippant about that. I mean that like you can learn if you, if it requires a visual learning aspect, you can learn just about anything you want on, on YouTube. It's incredible. My, my 16 year old, again, she, 
I probably I talked to her a lot more because her sisters are at school, you know, but she and I were having a conversation the other day and she was telling me she is she is a very, very smart young woman and um, but she hates math, but she does really well in it. And she was complaining about things I wouldn't think about when I was her age. Like she was complaining about basically she was saying the methodology that her teacher used to teach didn't work with her. And I said, well, you're getting A's in class. How do you do it? And she said, I go to YouTube. There's a there's a there's like a creator on YouTube that pretty much has this entire year that I'm studying online. And I just go to, you know, their their YouTube channel and I, you know, I find whatever we're working on and they explain it really well. So I was impressed that, you know, she didn't just say, well, I have a bad teacher and I'm not right. going to do it's, well. It's she my teacher's fault. It. Yeah. And, you know, she, she, she found it on her own. Yeah. Right. She found it on her own, but that you can go through and the things you can get done. So, yeah, it's it, it's pretty amazing. So. All right, well, let's kind of get into the main event. Um, before we get started, why don't you give us a quick thumbnail sketch on your background, kind of your role today, and how you got started in technology? Uh, okay, so I, I will tell you, at, at any time I'm doing, giving you a really, really long answer, you can you can stop me. But uh, So my name is Hayden McWhorter. I am the CIO at Premise Health. Uh, we are a, a direct primary care uh, company. We can get into what that, what that means. Uh, but basically, we do on-site, near-site, virtual health care, really about the access of healthcare for large self-insured employers. Um, so I, I have been with Premise uh, actually since before their foundation. Premise is the, the bring together of three organizations. I used to work for a company called W Squared, which was a uh, partner. Plow did a lot of work mm -hmm. with us. Um, I was a CIO there. And then when we all came together, I became the CTO at Premise. And that was in 2014. Uh, I became the CIO in 2016 after my mentor, I left to do something else. Uh, we, what was interesting was, you know, he and I had hoped there would be a succession plan when he decided to leave. I would be the next guy. We are owned by a private equity organization. So I had to go through um, a, a lot of, of interviewing to get to get the job. Um, and it actually came down between me and a local, uh, another local CIO that I'm, I think the world of. And, and uh, um, the funny thing is I ran into him and, uh, uh, I told him I told him I knew we were both up for the job and, you know, we, we were just kind of smiling. And I was told afterwards when my boss told me that, hey, here's the finalist. And I was kind of like, well, crud. And he's like, what? And I was like, that is one guy that I would report to. I, I like I, I, I he's a good guy. He'd be a great fit. So like three days later, they call me and they offer me the job. And um, he said, I think you need to know something since you gave, uh, you know, your competitor really such a, a, a glowing reference. He said the same about you. He said he came in for his final interview and he said, well, when did Hayden leave? And he's, they're like, oh, he's still here. And he's like, why are we having this conversation? And so uh, I, I think it's fair in case he listens, that was Andy Flat, and Andy uh, is just the best guy ever. And so, but a lot of mutual respect for him. So, but that was 2016. That's when I became the CIO here. So I've been the CIO since. Uh, prior to that, I was with Healthways um, from 2006, 2012. I was a CISO, CTO, CIO, international guy, did a lot of stuff there. Uh, before that, I was with uh, one of Premises earlier companies. I was with them for six or seven years. So I've been in healthcare IT my, my entire life. Okay. Uh, my, my start is really interesting. My start goes back to what I was telling you about kind of being the Geek in high school. I was uh, in college. I uh, graduated from uh, Auburn University, and uh, I was in college and did not do so great. I was a young. I, I went to college at seventeen. Didn't do so great my first year. My mom called me and said, "You know, you didn't do so great, so you need to get a job if you want to stay in school." Basically, and my neighbor called me and said, "You know, uh, this was again back. There was no cell phone, so she called me. She hung up with me." He called me within three minutes. And so I knew it had been a little bit planned, but he's like, <laughs> you know, I hear you're, I hear you're in the crapper with your mom. And I was like, yes, sir. I am. He said, well, come up to Birmingham, which is where I, that's where I was from originally, Birmingham, Alabama. He said, come up to Birmingham. And I think I have an opportunity for you where I work. I had no idea what he did for a living. I thought he worked in a morgue. So I had no idea what he did. So I ended up going to Birmingham. I go into this building that has no signage on it. And back then you signed out, you filled out a, a you know, your application and you handed it straight to the HR person. Uh, so they interviewed me right away. And the, the lady's like, uh, you're too young to do this. You're too young to do this. You're too young to do this. She was like, how'd you even hear about us? I was like, well, my neighbor, she's like, who's your neighbor? I told him 
this was back in the intercom days because this was like a giant warehouse that had been converted to an office. And she calls my neighbor to the office. He comes in, still looks like he's, if you remember Quincy from way back, that's what he looked like. He was in a white lab coat, had no idea what he did. And uh, he walks me into the VP of HR's uh, office. And my whole career was decided on this. He said the same thing. You're too young to do this. You're too young to do this. You're too young to do this. He said, uh, what can you do? And I, again, I'm at this time probably 18 and a half, 19 years old. I'm like, I, in my mind, I'm like, I can't do anything. But my neighbor's like, hey, you're good with computers, right? And I said, yeah, this is, and I explained what I did in high school and explained right. I'd work for a computer store. And uh, the VP guy's like, okay, my DP, so data processing manager, didn't even call it IT, is always looking for somebody. He said, let's go upstairs. You have to take a drug screen. Uh, if you pass your drug screen uh, and it's like a drug and alcohol screen, you're hired. So I did that. I got called. And so, again, I still didn't know what we did till the day I started. It turns out it was a clinical and pathology laboratory, and my neighbor actually worked in the lab. Um, now, what's interesting, it'll be interesting for people that are here in uh, Middle Tennessee, is that my boss, that DP manager that they were talking about, is, was a gentleman named Mark Farrington, who's been my mentor for many years. Uh, and so Mark has literally known me. That's an icebreaker that we always use. That Mark has known me since, I think, maybe 19, since I was 19 years old. So right. we go back a long way. So <laughs> anyway, that's how I got started. Uh, I, we, we were acquired, that company. I worked in school. Every weekend I came home and worked. Every holiday I came home and worked. And at the end of it, I had two opportunities. The company had offered me a job to be a full-time IT guy there. And Mark called me and said, hey, I have an opportunity. He'd gone on to another company at this time. He said, I have an opportunity, if you're interested, uh, to go to Dallas. It was actually Hearst, Texas, uh, to work in IT uh, at one of our regional laboratories. And uh, I made the decision uh, for two reasons. One, it was Mark. Two, uh, the company in Birmingham offered me $21,000, and, and Mark offered me $24,000. And I made basically a huge life decision on 3000 bucks. But... <laughs> I seemed like a lot of money at that time. You seemed yeah. like a, a, for a college guy, it was a lot of money. That's right. Uh, that was in 1990. Uh, and so uh, I was in Dallas in that area. Middle, I was in uh, uh, the Arlington area for a couple of years. And then in 92, I was promoted to Nashville and I've been in Nashville ever since. So I've been in Nashville since 1992. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, you, you picked up on a couple of themes there or threads. It's interesting that we'll get into mentorship uh, and private equity because I want to ask you about both of those. Um, but, you know, given your background and kind of your the sort of the contours of your career, yeah, there's a bunch of directions that we could go um, go in with this conversation. And, and maybe we'll do a part two uh, and, and, and pick up on a couple others if, if I could if I could uh, weasel the time out of you. Uh, but today I, I want to pick up on one of those threads um, and it relates back to our, our last the last episode I just recorded. And, and that's about the sort of the necessarily symbiotic relationship between IT and the business side of the house. Um, and in particular, I want to hear you talk some about, I'm going to ask some questions. I want to hear you talk some about how you see IT's responsibility for understanding and integrating itself into the business side of the house. So kind of looking at it from that perspective. So to get us started, um, you gave us, you gave us kind of a, you know, a little bit of a breakdown of your career, but what was the first true IT leadership role, um, that involved a heavy dose of business stuff? When, when, when did that happen, um, in, in your, in your career? Well, I mean, that was that was probably early on. I mean, that I, I worked for one of the places I got a lot of experience early. Um, so when I moved to Nashville in 92, I was working for a company called Allied Clinical Laboratories. And by 95, uh, we had been purchased. Uh, and it really, that became LabCorp. Allied was part of the piece that became LabCorp. So the Burling, the guys from Burlington, that, that they bought Allied? Right, okay. right. So it, it, yeah, so they... All that kind of came together to form LabCorp. Um, I, I went on and worked for another uh, laboratory, a pathology laboratory, for a couple of years. Um, and then from there, uh, I had a chance. That was a smaller organization. So I was the VP of IT, but had a chance to do a lot of other stuff. That was probably, let's say, um, you know, 95, 96. What was some of that other stuff? You said you're the VP of IT, but you got a chance to do some do other stuff. Well, give me some examples. Uh, operations, HR, uh, okay. presenting to our president. I mean, we were a small team and uh, quick. You were just a business executive who happened to be doing IT. And that, that was sense. pretty much it. Cause I, it, cause it, I ended up at one of the organizations uh, we went to, we were doing um, long-term care 
for nursing homes. So we we were outsourced physicians for long-term care. It was called long-term care physicians. That company ended up not succeeding. In the last probably six months of that year, I ended up doing more operations than I did IT. I was responsible for helping shut down sites and disposing of assets and how we did with people. Uh, even when I was with um, the other company, the pathology company, I did a lot of work that was, I was an operations person for one of our smaller labs. So it, I really, I, you know, I think the best advice I would give, I give to my kids all the time is, you know, don't be afraid to take an opportunity and and, and kind of run with it. And so what would happen was I'd be the IT guy and, and I'd be in a meeting and I would start asking questions like, how are you going to do this? And how would we do this? And how would this all come together? And people started realizing that I, I understood much more of the business than just the IT component. Like I understood how a laboratory was was built. And, and that was really, fortunately, just because I'd been in the business so long, I understood one, from an IT perspective, where issues could pop up. And two, things that my my coworkers who worked in the lab, things that drove them crazy. So right. if something wasn't set up right, it's like, hey, why are we doing that? Could we move it here? And then people started to say, they started including me in more meetings. Like, hey, you know, can you come? And sometimes it was IT based. Was many times there had some IT piece, but a lot of times it was just, what do you think about this? And as we come together, but it was going to work for smaller organizations where they required you to wear, you know, more hats than you would at a, an organization of our size. So, so that's, that's interesting because one of the things I was going to ask you is how'd you prepare for that role? But what you just described to me was you basically, you prepared for it by the, the previous roles you'd had and having broader experience. Right. And, and that came, you know, fortunately for, to a certain degree from being in a small organization, because you can't have as much specialization inside a small company. It's just, it just doesn't work. Right. It's just not possible. Right. Well, and I think, you know, um, working with Mark when I was back in Birmingham, you know, sometimes, you know, his ability, I'd watch him do stuff in meetings where he may not know exactly the direction we needed to take, but he knew the right questions to ask and he knew the research he would need to do. And he taught, I think he taught me that as well. Like be confident in the things, you know, you know, make sure you understand the vision of where somebody's trying to go. And then you can kind of go back and fill in the blanks on either the technology component or other pieces that you, that, that you need to have. So right, right. I, I was just, I wanted to grow and I wasn't afraid to take on as much responsibility as, as someone would let me take on. So let's talk a little bit about, um, about Mark and your mentoring relationship. How, see, you, you went to work for him because that was, he, he needed somebody to do tech stuff, right? Kind of in the, but, but how did that relationship, I mean, how, how did that, how did that develop? Was that fairly, did it just, was it sort of organic? Did you, did you feel like you just kind of, you guys worked well together? Um, was it, was it something that were, were you um, intentional about developing the relationship or did it just evolve? I would say maybe all the above. I mean, I, which is probably a cop-out answer, but if I think about it uh, at the time that, that, that laboratory before Roche bought that laboratory eventually, but before Roche bought it, um, it was owned by, it, Mark would know the numbers, but I think it was owned by 13 pathologists, maybe 12 pathologists and an executive leader, 13 pathologists and the executive leader. And so in some ways it was a lot, it was a family, you know, it was, it was, a, um, you know, they, the founders were there every day working. Um, if you looked at, you know, this is at least how I remember it, Mark may remember it different, but if you look at our IT team, it wasn't a massive IT team, it was probably 10 people. Uh, including the weekend operators, which is what I was, or nighttime operators. We ran things 24-7. But the, the the team that was working there, especially as young as I was, they they were very helpful in teaching me and explaining to me um, what was going on and what we needed to do. And, you know, and with Mark, a lot of times, because he 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 was what would be called the CIO today, but he was also like our lead developer, because the system we had we had purchased, we did all these modifications to. So right. You know, he would come explain what he was doing and why he was doing it. Um, but in some ways, he, he's only at the time, you know, he was only 26 or 27 years old. He was incredibly young. And so a lot of us were young. And so I think we just, you know, we would hang out and like go to lunch together or like on the weekends. He'd say, hey, yeah, come by, you know, we'll, you know, just catch up or whatever right, else. Right. So, it was like a little bit of a band of brothers in that sense, but the kind of similar life stages to a certain degree. To a certain degree. And then I think mm -hmm. over time, I think we had, we both grew up in Birmingham. We had very similar backgrounds. We looked at things the same way. We, I think we had a lot of 
probably the same personalities. He's brilliant. I'm not brilliant, but he's brilliant. But we had a lot of the same types of things that we thought of that were important to us and, and the way we looked at stuff. And, and uh, I think that helped, that helped as well too. So I don't know much about Mark's background. Uh, so what was his experience that you said he was 26, 27, had he started there or had he been somewhere else prior to coming to that particular, how, how did he build his skill set? I guess would be, but was, was sort of my question. Uh, so, if, so you'll have to get him on one day to, so he can tell you the whole thing is I won't do it justice. Well, first of all, he was a, a frustrated musician, even in Birmingham. So he and his buddies since high school had had probably younger and had a, a band and they did a lot of stuff. He made money that way, but he worked at UAB. Uh, I think Mark's degree is in biology. He worked in UAB, at UAB for a professor and he was figuring out how to take things they were doing as they were looking at organisms. I think the thing that sticks out to me is they were doing some things with frogs to see reactions. And he figured out how to interface a computer so that when they like touched a probe on the frog, the data they got back immediately went into the computer. So from there, I don't remember exactly how he ended up at, uh, at MedLab, but he ended up there in kind of the same thing. I think he, I think he actually came in and was was uh, again, I think I think I have this right. This is way back in the Wayback Machine. I think there was already a leader there. He came in and pretty quickly, because he was able to, and it kind of goes back to this original conversation. So he was really able to understand what the doctors were asking for and how he could make it happen. And he was able to do that so well that he ended up becoming the leader of the group because it right. was really about how do you, how do you make us go faster and how do you take the need we have here and convert it to, you know, into technology. And, um, he did, just did that very well. And he taught gotcha. me like, he taught me a couple of things, do that. And you're going to get invited to the table. The other thing he taught, kind of taught me is, but be accountable to what you said you're going to do. And that'll also help you because if you, if you can be, you know, as much as possible, you know, always return what they need they're going to see value because they're going to say, okay, this is somebody we can count on. They understand right. how, you know, how they talk our language. And it was us learning their language too. Sometimes, you know, they would ask us to do stuff and, you know, Mark would, would come back and say, okay, here's what we need to figure out. Here's what they're asking. I think, but this is what we need to look at. And so. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. That's, that's helpful. Cause uh, you know, I was, I was thinking of this next question and it, it was in that context around understanding how did, how did Mark get to the position you know, say five, six, seven years ahead of you in that sort of process, right? And but when you think back to that, those sort of early days, you know, what was the hardest thing to pick up when it came to the business side of the role? And and you know, you gave a little advice earlier, but within that context, what? How might somebody think about that if they're if they're dealing with a specific area they're trying to struggle, they're struggling with to fig, to sort of pick up? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Again, this ties to what you and I were talking about before uh, earlier when you asked me about technology. I mean, back then it was you just had to go find people that you could talk to and ask questions. He was like, so what I would do, I, I didn't work during the day. I was a weekend operator and I was a, a third shift operator. So whoever was on vacation, I took a shift. And what I found, especially at third shift, which was normally say 11 o'clock at night till you know six or seven o'clock the next morning, is that laboratories run differently at that time. It's a whole different crew that come in, a little bit different personality in that they're a little bit I mean, it, it can be wild, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, you get you get some characters overnight, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and they're doing so much work that at night, if something popped up, instead of just taking a phone call, I would say, can I come upstairs and look at it? And so I'd run upstairs and they'd say, here's what something that's going on. Or we have an interface problem. Or we have whatever. Or you just start to ask people about their areas of expertise. You know, now it's all YouTube. You know, if you have if you have an interest, you know, you could probably spend one long weekend and you could you could talk at least. At, to some intro level at whatever you need to talk about. But back then it was just through relationships. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That's fair. I mean, I think probably the answer is both, right? That, you know, and I, I talked to my kids. It's, it's funny. We're, we're just two old guys, I guess at this point, this is where we are. But, you know, the, the fact that you can learn a lot from YouTube or online resources is great, but there's still something to be said for, uh, you know, for, for engaging someone who's been there and done that. And, and getting their perspective on things or getting them to do show and tell for you or explain something. Um, so I think if you, I think being able to put those two pieces together is a pretty powerful combination for learning. Well, I also think, you know, this goes back to my mom. Again, I grew up in, in Birmingham and in Alabama. My mom had, uh, I lost her in 95. She was younger than I am now when she passed away, but she had a lot of great life advice for me. And, you know, she'd always tell me it's not, it's not what you know, it's who you know. 
And so, which was encouraging to build your network and stuff. Yep. And so, you know, and that's what I did. If you think about it, I got my first job because I knew my neighbor. And then I got my next job because I knew Mark. And then I got my next job because whatever. But what's interesting is one day she told me, I made a comment about that. And she said, well, you need to know the second part. It's like, it's not what you know, it's who you know that gets you in the door. But what you know keeps you in the door. So, you know, it's like one of those things It's like, yes, you may use a, a, a connection to get you in. But ultimately, once you're in, it's what you know has to keep you there. And it's are you continuing to learn and grow? So it's not just about building your network, but making sure that you understand, you know, what you're getting into. Well, on the theme of learning and growing, this next one kind of goes at that. And so, you know, you're like me, we're getting old now. And so you start to, you can, you can think of things in decades now, which is sort of, it's a little scary actually. I know. Um, but given the changes you've seen, let's just kind of take the last 10 years, right? So you've been at premise, you said, I think you said 2014. Um, I know there's been some machinations kind of moved around, but let's just past 10 years, right? Um, yeah. What are, are there business discussions or areas of focus that you're dealing with now that you really didn't have to deal with in the early part of your career. And if there, if there are, how have you gone about getting fluent in those or trying to figure those out? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's several things, but I mean, the biggest thing that I can think about is when I, when we, when premise was formed, so you're right. I, I came over basically in 2012 premise was formed in 2014. And I would say the biggest thing then was we were an on-site healthcare company focused on being on a campus for an employer. So you know, we have a big we have a big employer. We're going to be on their campus. Um, then we really started understanding access was what you had to look at. So then it was like you have a near site. So it's some place that's not on campus, but in a, in a general vicinity that picks up not only the employees, but their dependents. Um, and so you start to build from there. I would say the thing and it's really been more. The last four or five years that that all seems blurry, too, but last four or five years is how. I would say how technology has picked up on bandwidth on those things and allow like zoom and teams and all the, the, the virtual stuff that you can do now. So, you know, right before 2020, we had a huge push. We converted to Epic for um, all of our primary care sites. Uh, we signed our deal in 2017. And by the end of 2018, we had converted every single one of our sites. So it was a massive undertaking, but going into 2019, one of the things we wanted to take advantage of, was Epic's ability to use local virtual health, which meant that if you already had a, a a doctor set up at your clinic, that your doctor could set up a video visit if you wanted to. That was something inherent to the Epic system. But we were pushing, working with Epic and pushing them to figure out how we would do a national virtual health like Teladoc and others were doing, where you could come in, you didn't have to have a relationship. And that was something, if you think about it, that virtual access and thinking about virtual as a whole for what we do, but also how we were working at the time. Again, now this is pre-COVID. So 2019, we have uh, we have some co-workers. Um, Lisa Duncan was the, the, the woman that led the, the, the plan, which I remember we kept moving the, the, the finish line on her. It's like, you just need us to get in five states and we're good. You just need us to be in 15 states and we're good. And finally, we had a big customer that were like, get us in all 40, like 45 states, which she did. And, you know, you could call it luck or you could call it, you know, awesome planning but that she finished that up in december of 2019 we started Perfect rolling it out in 2020 yeah. and then we ended up having to go virtual for a lot of our sites in march of, of you know 2020 so um i would say that i would say modes of connectivity and how we're doing those things um that's something over the last year because in the beginning of premise the focus was on how do we find technology synergies that we support the organization? We bring things together. The Epic, Epic's a great example. We had six different EMRs. We had all this stuff going on. We were unable to give a consistent product out to our sites because one might be on one EMR, one might be on another EMR. And so uh, it was right before we sold to our current private equity organization that we went out and just did a really big deal with Epic and it, it, it turned out to be great. Epic was a great partner for us. They're still a great partner for us. And um, the move was what we needed to do. But that switch to virtual really, I mean, you go, you think back to 2012, that wasn't even in your line of sight, I would guess the, the idea of, of, of delivering services virtually, uh, certainly not at that kind of scale. I would say in 2012, I would, you know, there's a couple of things. One, I would have never thought that we would have been able to move to Epic. That would be the first thing because Epic was the foundation to get us to virtual. And then the other was we we 
we talked about, you know, virtual every once in a while, but it was still virtual at the time was not this type of virtual virtual at the time was you had a big Cisco setup. Uh, yeah. Closed circuit or you're, you're delivering in-house, you know, you're having to build, you know, it was, it was a big CapEx to get the system set up and to run. You had to have the right bandwidth capability. I mean, there was, it, it doesn't seem like it, but even 2012, I mean, internet connectivity wasn't what it, I mean, it, the ubiquity of it wasn't what it is today. Um, and it certainly was a lot more expensive, <laughs> you know, that's, there's no question about that. So, that's correct. um, well, you mentioned your private equity, uh, the, the private equity deal. And so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. It's not, it's not something everybody deals with, but I find it interesting just because it's a, you know, when I've talked to people who've been in organizations that have been, a, that have taken private equity investment, the stories are, are not all the same, but there's, there's definitely some similarities, um, uh, that, that they, that they, exp- they talk about, you know, some are really good and some not so good. And that's the nature, I guess, of all investment. But, um, given that experience, particularly, you know, I know you've been in a couple different, a couple different deals and in different, different, different areas of it. what, what are some of the things you learned through working through that with a, with a group of people who are, you know, the typically business people, they're not technical people. Um, and, and I think the uh, euphemism I'd use is highly outcome oriented. Um, I, maybe we, you could think of, you know, the, the good, the good PE firms are ones that are fun to work with or are positively outcome oriented. And maybe some of the others are a little uh, harder to work with in terms of that aspect, but, but, but it'd be interesting to hear what that, what that dimension has been like in the context of, of doing your job and, and that theme of, of IT working and integrating into the business side of the house. Well, I think I think you have to understand your audience. So, so when I was at when I was at Healthways, they they provided for me at least they they gave me a mentor, and his name was Bill Evans. Bill passed away, I think in 2015 he passed away. So I think he's been gone now almost eight years. But he was he was I thought was a great sales guy. He'd had a massive heart attack and had to come in off the road, and so he he still connected a lot of people in our office. And so that's why they gave me, uh, gave me him as a mentor. And one of the things that he always told me is he said, you should never go into a room, not knowing who's going to be in the room and what they are going to be focused on. And, you know, and to your point, it, when you're dealing with private equity, or I'd say anybody with a finance, you know, what they're really, they're trying to get to the end point is how much is this going to cost? Is this going to, you know, push OPEX, save OPEX? Is this going to push CapEx? Um, are we going to have any uh, return on investment here? Are you going to have any type of synergies? Like they're they're very it's very in cut and dry because while they understand and want to understand how the technology will help the system, to them everything that and, and this is true, everything that you're investing in should have some benefit that you're able to explain and measure on the backside of it. Now that's hard sometimes when you say. Hey, we're moving from this to Meraki. Hey, we're doing this because sometimes that's just that's just that's plumbing to them. It's like okay, right. that's a, that's just plumbing. But you know, as you start to explain uh, why identity management is important, which is something we're working through right now, or why you want to do uh, uh, data mesh or like some things like that, which may have a bubble cost in the front, you have you have to be a little more thoughtful about how you go through that that whole yeah. process. Yeah, that's. And I think that's probably a variation on a theme uh, in general, you know, equity investors or not, right? That could be the same for, uh, you know, a, a, in, a, in a medium-sized company that's, that's privately held, right? The owners, the owners are going to, could very well take that same approach, right? And need that same level of, of understanding and explanation, right? And, and, and to your point, it reminds me of the old Dale Carnegie, right? Speak in terms of other people's interests, right? You've got to figure out a way to put these things uh, into context, that they can understand, um, which does, you know, does get to, uh, there was a question, you know, I was thinking about this, this aspect of it and it's how have you managed, you, you talked a little bit about virtualization or the virtual move and, and the move to Epic. And, uh, obviously you've seen a lot of technology, technology change and, and, and morph over the course of your career. How have you managed to stay abreast of changing technologies and, and what strategies have you found really, you know, really effective at trying to translate some of that for the business side of the house? I mean, you mentioned, I'll give you an example, you mentioned identity management and that's a, that's a fairly new, I mean, it's, it's an old concept, right? But it's, it's taken on, it's now something you really have no choice, but to think about, um, if, if you're really an organization of any size, if you're more than one person, and frankly, if you're one person, you got to think about it. Um, but certainly if you're two, two or more. And so it just maybe use that as an example. Well, I think, I mean, it's kind of, I, I think there's a couple of things to think about it. One is like, you, you've got to. You, you just, I mean, I think you have to be thoughtful in, in, in your approach because 
uh, some of these things you have to really make sure that you're explaining in a way that again, they're, they're, what is the outcome and what is the, what is the benefit of the things that, that we're trying to do or the investments that we're trying to make? You know, we, I, I kind of go back to a little bit stepping back, but if you look at understanding what people need, like it, the first thing you need to understand is like, what is your CFO's playbook? And I think, you know, Brian and I've talked about this, Cameron and I've talked about this, and I'm very fortunate to have an awesome uh, CFO. But if you understand their playbook, that helps you a lot because, you know, if they're trying to avoid, you know, an operational spin because they're concentrating on EBITDA and they need you to do the same thing. And they're looking at things more capital capitalized because I, I would say, you know, for us, we are branching into and have become branching into new newer technologies. But in the beginning, it was control IT cost. I want to see I don't want to see spend, you know, unless we're approved. I want to see spend, say, say it's some something that, you know, it, it, it was funny when our CFO and I sat down. We've known each other for a long time. But she's like. I don't want any good news or bad news. I just want it to be, I want to be able to turn on, you know, turn on my, my dashboard and, and this is where you are. And I know that's where you are, which is actually very empowering because if you know, this is where you have to hit, you have a lot of ability to move underneath that number. And if you have to go above the number, there are things that things that you can do, but it's understanding their playbook. And for us, um, we are very EBITDA focused. So we're looking, what is the bottom line? So, we have had a slow approach to cloud. I mean, in some ways, we may not be very exciting at all because we slow approach to cloud. Uh, we've we've had on-prem stuff. Now, something we did. Oh, it's the- very. I mean, cloud's very opex focused, right? So that's you know that's the nature of the the nature of the of the the business that the SaaS model really. It's it's that's what it is. Right. Yeah. Well, and and so one of the things we did when we came together in 2014, we moved to Office 365, which was a big push, which stressed our security guy out a little bit, but he understood our system a little bit. Uh, he understood what we we're trying to do. And my thing was, we were gonna push as many things out outside the data center as we could, which was not the way we had stor- historically done it. Historically, I want everything in the data center so I can control it. Well, now all around it's like, it. right, yeah. But yeah, now it's like, I want everything out because if you look back at other, you know, as you learn, as you grow, DR is super expensive. DR is like, you know, that was the thing. How do I get people to spend on DR? Because, you know, it's like an insurance policy. Yeah, it's it's insurance. It's like, it's like I mean, a lot of security stuff. The problem is it is like you're, you're asking people to pay, pay higher insurance premiums, right? With the hope that you never, you never have to, you never have to file a claim. And that's, you know, it feels like wasted money in that case. Exactly. But we knew that if we could figure out how many, how many applications we could do SaaS based where we're really more concerned about you know, having a smaller footprint that we have to fire up. And then we are, we are, you know, as we would contract and stuff, we would look at what is their DR capabilities. Right. Like with Epic, that was one of the big things. We do not host Epic. Epic hosts Epic for us. Now that's, you know, there's probably cost savings there if we said, okay, we're going to bring that in house. But the problem is Epic runs, has a special database running on cache. You got to find specific people that understand to do it. They have a lot more capacity because they have a lot of customers kind of coming together. They've already built a great DR plan. We just had to tell them, this is our DR plan. And uh, Jason Weinstein, who's my SVP over infrastructure with his team, they just kind of modeled out, okay, here's the optimal way for us to do this so that we have the ability um, to maximize you know, their DR capability for us for right. Epic. Right. Um, and so I would say you know, a lot of the stuff we've done to be, to be successful – has not come with major investments, but more thoughtful about how we control the costs and do things. Now, you get to a place, and this is where we are now, where we are moving some of our stuff into cloud because we have some data projects going on. Uh, we are looking at identity because of the data projects and other things going on. Right. And so there it's important to make sure that the leaders understand an overall goal and an overall endpoint. You know, it's kind of like, here's our North Star, here's where we're trying to go. Now that's that that's always tight because you know sometimes you, you there's theories on where we're going to be and how we're going to be and you kind of got to work to that. But th- there you hope that your institutional credit that you've gotten through years of success allows you to get you know you know maybe a little bit of okay we're going to trust you on this until we get to here or whatever else. So well, that's an interesting story because you know there's so much. I mean, obviously, you know the discussion around the cloud. Uh, has probably sucked up all the air out of the room for the most part, at least in terms of technology discussions. And so I think most people sort of assume, and I, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'd be curious to know if you get this from business people, 
do they just assume you guys are going to want to do more in the cloud because that's all they that's all they see and hear about when the reality is it's not the answer to everything right it it has lots of it, it's just like anything else it's a tool it's a tool to be used in the right set of circumstances and with the right set of needs right and so in your case it sounds like you're really and like most large organizations really it's a hybrid approach right it's going to depend on the it's going to depend on the use case so. it's going to depend on the use case and I, and I would say my peers our other senior executives on our CEOs uh, you know direct report list they're very good at asking questions so they don't come in and like you know, they don't run into somebody at the lacrosse field and find out, oh, you know, I ran into this guy and he says, this is the thing you should do. They, they're always asking questions like, why would we do this? And how is this going to help us? And, and that's where it's important to say, okay, remember this issue your team's having, this solves that issue and this issue and this issue. So it's really, um, they do a great job. I have to give them a lot of credit. They do a great job of asking questions and, um, and, and they trust us. They have us at the table. I mean, you know, I report directly to the CEO. So that's a that's an important piece. That's good to have that back and forth learning, right? Because then you can go because there's there's areas of expertise that you've got that they don't have and vice versa. Right. And so that's the hope is the, the cumulative effect out of that is better than in anyone in, you know, on their own. The whole idea of a team in general. Um, all right. Well, I've, I've kind of taken you for a while. I got a couple more questions and then we'll sort of we'll sort of wind it down. Um, OK. We talked some about mentoring early on. Obviously, you've got, you know, and, and had a strong relationship with Mark Farrington. And I know, uh, at least my understanding, you still do. Um, do you do you continue to see him as a mentor? Is that I mean, you're a senior level person now. And I'm curious to know how you sort of think about that concept, given where you are in your career. Uh, and, and, and what does that look like now? Um, so, you know, I would say I, I would still say yes, because I think some days I still feel like I'm the you know, the 18, 19 year old kid, and he's still the 26 or 27 year old kid. Um, I, I do think, you know, while we had a lot of the similar strengths, he he has strengths that I don't have, and maybe I have some that he doesn't have, but he, he's still a great person. To, we just don't get the chance to talk like we used to, um, but he's still a great person to talk to. He'll still send me emails or check in or stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's really, it's really good to have that. I, I do find though, at, at this stage, What's really helpful is probably, and what I would consider Mark now, more like a peer mentor, because, you know, sometimes you need somebody who sat in the seat before where you can say things where they, they, you know, especially someone you trust where they can get enough of the information to help you. You know, if you've got like, hey, I could go this way or this way. Did you ever face anything like this? I sure did. It's like when you and I started and I was asking about the podcast, here are two things I would do different. Well, now... I could say, hey, you know, Brian, if I did this and this, what do you think if I did A or B? And you you could quickly say, no, I think you need to think about this or do this. And so I would say, you know, mentoring now just looks different. Now it's more that circle, those relationships that you've built. You know, I'll reach out to Brian or Cameron every once in a while, especially if I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking for, hey, they're connected to a certain group, they can help me with this. Or, hey, this person really, I know that they, you know, Harold Bandy's super, super smart. I know I can go to Harold and I can ask him questions, uh, you know, although I haven't done that in a while, but I, I know I can pick up the phone and do it. So it's really kind of, um, I work with a team now, a couple of consultants that have worked for really large organizations and, you know, the size we are today and where we want to grow, go, we're, we're growing into those new processes and things. And they're like, Hey, this is, let me tell you about the time I did the same thing. Here's some things you might want to know. And so, it's probably more peer mentoring now, but I definitely look out. To, I, I'm I'm an extrovert, as you can tell. I I like to to be around people. I like to talk, and so for me, you'll be surprised how much you can catch just asking questions, like you said you like to do. So yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so you know, when you think about it from your perspective, and this, you know, we we all are limited by our own perspective, so I, I recognize that. But it, I'm interested to hear your perspective on it as you think about or try to assess the state or the current state of the relationship between IT and the business side of the house, not just inside premise, but more sort of maybe globally. Um, do you think that's getting better or is it better than it has been? And if so, why, why do you think that is, or, or, or why do you think it's not? If, if maybe it's not. Um, you know, I, I've always said I'm, I'm, I am kind of the wrong person to ask those questions because at premise IT has been involved and it has had the seat at the table since the beginning of premise. Uh, I mean, it's, it's something that, IT it's is foundational to the organization. It's foundational to the organization. They understand that. They understand that provides enterprise value. They understand all that stuff. So they they've always been in. I'm I'm really kind of more shocked 
from time to time when I hear that there are organizations that still don't understand, you know, th- those pieces. And I always joke, I think of an, if I, I think of an IT organization at, at, you know, I say sometimes I think most IT organizations, if they just had a good PR team, most people would realize like how, how well they actually do. Because unfortunately, if you don't have those relationships, all they see is IT as a, is a, is a spend. It's a, yeah. it's a, you know, it's a resource suck on, you know, technology services or software and all the maintenance and it's just expensive, you know, and, and, you know, it's just, it's just an, an evil part of having to, to, to run the business where really, you know, when you have those open communications, things, there's so many things, little things that we can tweak that make big, you know, can have big, big outcomes on the backside. So yeah, if you didn't have IT, you'd have to make it up, right? I mean, it's like I always joke at I always joke at Plow. I say that you know, realistically, IT uh, Plow as a as a outside service provider is no different than an internal IT department in this sense, right? We're the offensive linemen of the business world, right? Generally, only time anybody notices uh, notices us is if we screw up, right? You know, when you watch a football game on Sunday or on Saturday, you never see an offensive lineman's name called unless he gets a penalty, right? I mean, that's just a, it's just the way it is. Now he could be he could be grading out a hundred. Uh, on his blocking and literally be getting the guy behind him 200 yards a game, but the guy running the ball gets all the credit, right? And so to your point, the, you know, the, the PR aspect of that, I think is, is absolutely true, but it's also incumbent on us, I think, to deliver, find ways to show that value um, on, on a regular basis, which isn't always easy to do, but you know, if it was easy to do, everybody would do it. Right. So. Well, I, I think, I think you have to be, you know, like, I, I think again, with plow or or other vendors that have special special uh, services or things that they can bring to the table, sometimes it's admitting to a senior leadership team that, hey, you know, I don't know, I am not the the expert in this, but I know the experts in this, and sometimes you can gain trust even through connecting the right people into the thing. Again, because really it's the outcomes they're looking for. What is the outcome? Did you yeah. did you save money? Did you improve a process? Did you do something that's making us better? Because we want to be better. Because you know, here for us. If our hope is that by being better, we're transferring that down to our patients. We call them our members, that we're doing the best we can for them. And it's technology doing everything it can to provide that best best service. And, you know, we hope it is. I'm sure from time to time we mess up, but we hope it is. So. Yeah. And I, I mean, I got into IT. I was not a technology person at all. I was accidentally, I got, ac- I accidentally got into this game um, at, at a previous employer and, and, you know, was sort of an accidental CIO for lack of a better term, but it was always, I never had a problem saying I didn't know something because the leadership team that asked me to do it knew from the beginning that I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I knew it was one of those, you know, you know, more than anybody, an expert is somebody who knows more than you. And, and that, that's not a very, that's not a very good definition of an expert, but that's sort of how it shook, you know, how it shook out. And so it was always fine. I, I never had any, I never had any ego about like, being the smartest guy in the room around technology. Cause I knew I wasn't. And so, it, you know, to go find people to help me was, was the very first thing I had to do. Cause I'm like, there's no way I'm going to figure this out on, on my own. And that's a, I recognize that's a little bit of a different path. Um, and it, it comes with its challenges and limitations for sure, but also had the advantage, at least from that perspective of, of not being, I, I was never worried like someone, and I never had that nagging sense. Like, well, if I don't know the answer to that question, is, is someone going to, going to doubt whether I'm a good IT person or am I, you know, I'm a good technologist. It didn't matter because I knew I wasn't. <laughs> so. Well, I, I, you know, I, you know, that's funny because my, I have a degree in finance. We talked about Mark has a degree in biology. There's a lot of IT people that didn't start out as IT people, but they were curious and wanted to expand. So I, I would say the, um, the, the one thing I learned early in my career, which has been super helpful is building a team around you. And I have a great team around me right now and I've had great teams around me and, uh, don't be afraid to tell them you don't know the answer. And that's why you brought him in. I brought you in because you're going to know the answer, not me. You're better at that's this. Right. And that's why we're here. So, well, I think that's a good one to, to to sort of head towards the end here. I do like to end with a couple of, I call them personal questions. They're not really personal questions. You know, I'm not going to ask you, uh, you know, overly personal questions, but they aren't particularly about the, about the business. So, um, but before I do let you go, um, maybe you could tell us something that you've watched or read lately that you think other people ought to check out. Something that I've watched or read lately that someone should check out. Um, I need to think about that. I, I mean, I'll say right now I'm I am watching uh, that I'm watching The Last of Us with my my daughter because uh, she's a huge she was into the game and so 
um, that that show stresses me completely out, but we are watching that. So <laughs> I, I might say that that that's so far has been a good watch. So okay, so so if you're if it's not a relaxing it's not a relaxing view. If you're not if you if you're if you're wanting to just chill, that's maybe not the right answer, but worth checking out. No, 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 no. no. I, I would I always say that the thing that I think the if people are into books, I always ask people. That's my icebreaker. What's your favorite book? Uh, a Boy's Life is my favorite book. It was it was written by a guy in Birmingham, and it's a it's a great book to read. Uh, that's my that's my number one book. So, gotcha. All right. Um, final question. Tell us about your first technology memory as a child, and it can't be TV or the phone. Um. Well, no. My first probably my first memory would be again because as old as I am at this point, technology really didn't occur until I, you know I was really in high school. So I would say the thing that still stands out to me today was my ability to program something into a computer and get it to give me an output. Um, I remember my very first programming in basic was I programmed a race car that it looked like it was, it would look like it was a dragster taking off and it, you know, had smoke coming out the back. It was, it was pixel. It was, it was awful. I mean, it was awful, but I just remember how cool I thought that was that you could do that, that and, and uh, when I worked in the computer store, I remember my first time that I saw uh, a Macintosh uh, where it had a voice. I loaded a voice simulation on it where it, you could type stuff and it would it would verbally say it. Uh, and I just realized then the power that we're going to wow. have is is just going to be incredible. So, well, with that, Hayden, uh, I'll let you get back to it. Thank you so much for the time. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast, and uh, look forward to getting together with you next time I'm in Nashville. Appreciate it, Brian. Thanks a lot. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Cut the shit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok at Cut the Shit Pod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day. <laughs>